Okay, I know one person that has read the reading this week, because that was from Isaiah, wasn't it? How about you others? Have you been reading? Jeremiah, Jeremiah okay. So, well, sounds familiar. Um, we'll be reading Jeremiah, not this week, but next week. Nahum, and I forgot what else. I'll try to remember to put sheets out here for you, but I won't be here. Terry and I will be gone, and Beth will be up here. Oh, Jacob will be gone too. Sorry. Caleb, make me go to the wall. Of course. Let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you. We thank you for your word. Lord, as we read and study your words, may you open our eyes, may you open up our hearts. May we repent and come to you. May we have a clear conscience to know that you are God and see the pattern that you've set forth, that you are faithful, even when we're unfaithful that you continually love us and love us and love us to the point where Jesus loves me, this I know. What greater love has a man than to lay down his life for his friends? Father, we thank you and praise you that you would send your son and that Jesus would lay down his life for us and that you would come to live with us and empower us and set us apart from the world to be your priest to this world. May we carry the torch brightly so that others see you, Father, through us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So last week, the message title was unfaithfulness. This week, it's faithfulness. Complete opposite of that. We looked at Hosea. You read Hosea, hopefully. You saw how God was using the prophet to tell the northern kingdom that they were adulterers. Not just adulterers, but in the business of professional harlotry. Because they had continued to sell out their love, their trust, their hope in things of this world, in people, rather than in the God creator who gives them life, who sustains life, who everything comes from. You know, I don't preach that often on hell, but when I do preach on hell... What I like to point out is it's the absence of anything that relates to God. Now, you can just go from there. You don't have to think about how bad it's going to be or this or that. It won't have anything to do with God. Wow, I cannot imagine a life without God's presence in it. He's there every single day in the, in the midst of, of the turmoils that face us. We know that He is there. He is our rock. He is our fortress. He is our strength. And all we have to do is turn to Him and turn from those other loves and love Him. So today I want to talk about faithfulness. If you've been reading, you've spent a lot of time reading Isaiah. And that's why that sounded very, very familiar. But Jeremiah is a similar prophet. Uh, we have many similar prophets. And amazing when you look in the New Testament, you see the same thing, except instead of it being just to the children of Israel, it's to the church, all that believe. James is one of the first letters written, and James is saying, I don't know if I believe your proclaimed faith because I don't see the actions. And so many of the other letters are, please continue in your faith. Know that these sufferings bring about your perseverance in everything. Don't be discouraged. The Lord has not come back. He will not forsake you and so on and so forth. And you don't know the love of the Father unless you know the love of the Son and you love one another. All these things so that we will have behavior that is like Christ, empowered by the power of the Spirit. But let's look at Isaiah, to, at Isaiah today a little bit. In the first chapter of Isaiah 1, verse 18 it reads, Come, now let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. If you will only obey me, you will have plenty to eat. Don't miss that point in there. There's the love of God there and His faithfulness and everything, but He requires His people to be holy. Don't miss that point. It's all throughout the Bible, and we miss that so many times in Scripture. Jesus loves me, so I can continue in my sin. That's a lie from the devil. You have been bought by the precious blood of Christ, 
In John chapter 3, when you read about God's love, it starts out, unless you are born again. That means you die to your old self so that you can be born anew. Those things should be foreign to us. We should want to obey with all of our heart. Jesus summed it up when he was asked what the greatest commandment was, to love the Lord your God with everything. And that will be shown in how you love your neighbor. All of the what we're reading, the laws and the prophets hang on these things. Verse 19, if only you will obey me, you will have plenty to eat. Verse 20, but if you turn away and refuse to listen. Shema, to listen and obey. To hear and obey, they go hand in hand. You are not listening if you don't obey. Go ask any of the children in the nursery. When I say, listen to me, what did I imply? Obey me. And God is exactly the same way. If you turn away and refuse to listen, you will be devoured by the sword of your enemies. I, the Lord, have spoken. See how Jerusalem once was so faithful, she has become a prostitute. Same message, different messenger. Clean up your act. God loves you. You are his children. And we don't even know about Jesus Christ yet from Isaiah, but, but there is a continued promise and unparalleled predictions of what this Savior will be like that he will be scorned, he will be beaten, he will be crucified, he'll be beaten beyond human recognition because of his love for you and I. Because it's what had to be done to save us. Jesus also said that he was going to return and settle this. When he came, he said he would return again. And so much of the prophecy that you're reading, you're, as you're reading, you're like, well, what is this prophecy talking about? Is it talking about something that Jesus has already fulfilled? Because I don't remember him fulfilling this. Or maybe it's talking about when he returns again. Because he will return again. And he will separate the sheep from the goat. And he will bring his reward with him. I, that one just blows me away. He will reward us for doing what we're supposed to do in the first place. I don't get that one when I get to the kids as much. When they do what they're supposed to, that's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> Why would I reward them for it? But he's going to bring his reward with us because that's how good he is. Maybe I should think about rewarding them more so they realize they are doing a good job. Maybe that's what I should do. Maybe I should set that pattern. But God himself who gave his life for me is going to come back and reward me for doing what I should have done in the first place. Thank you, Lord. Wow. On that day, there will be faithful and there will be unfaithful. There will be those sheep who think they are goats, but they are not. Or those goats that think they're sheep. I told you, Steve, if I get messed up, let me know. So I'm calling you to pay me attention because I'm tired. <laughs> this has been a long week. There are those sh goats that think they're sheep. But I don't care if you think you're a sheep, you act like a sheep, you eat with the sheep, you're either a sheep or you're not a sheep. And Jesus is clear. My sheep know my voice, and they obey it. In Matthew 24, Jesus talks about the future. If you have an NLT, that's what I'm reading, the New Living Translation. It says, Jesus speaks about the future, is the subtitle that's there. About things to come. He's talking to his disciples. He's not talking to the crowds here. He's talking to the disciples, telling them the things that will take place. So many of the things from Matthew 24 took place in Jerusalem in the year of A.D. 70 when Jerusalem was turned upside down and literally destroyed where they had to run for the hills. But some of the other things that Matthew 24 talks about is talking about when Jesus returns. And in the days of Noah, people will be eating and drinking and not having any idea that judgment is coming. But it is coming. It will come. And Jesus will return with his mighty angels, with fiery judgment. In Matthew 24, verse 37 to 39, it reads this way. When the Son of Man returns, not if, but when, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up until the time Noah entered into his boat. 
Sounds a lot like today in the United States, doesn't it? We don't need God because we are so blessed. We have so many other gods. Wait a minute, we don't like calling them idols, do we? But yet we do because we've put our faith, our trust, our love, our confidence in all these other things and instead of God. Verse 39, people didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came. People won't realize what's going to happen until Jesus comes again. Oh, and then there's a rest of that sentence, and swept them all away. I don't know if you remember it or not, that story about Noah's ark, but only Noah and his family entered that ark. Everyone else perished. There was no second chance. There were no life preservers thrown out from, from that boat. No king that could save them. Nothing else. They perished when that day came. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Pretty clear there, isn't he? If you read on, you'll read on about what Merle read this morning. A faithful, sensible or wise is what yours might say. That's what the King James uses. Servant. When I was reading this, I'm thinking about Solomon because he wrote all these words of wisdom. And I think, man, I'm glad he wrote those things, but I wish he would have lived it also. How many sons did Solomon have? Anybody know? Come on. Give me a, some kind of answer. How many wives did he have? Hundreds. Okay, we'll go with that. So how many children did he have? Billions. Thousands maybe. How many of them are named in the Bible? This one's easy. The one who took his place is on the throne. Who did not serve the Lord his God. Because with all these words of wisdom that Solomon wrote down, his actions didn't live it. And his son seen the inconsistency in his faith. And when the people came to his son and said, your father has put all these burdens on us. He's even put us into slave labor. Will you reduce these burdens? He said, <laughs> I'm going to be worse than you ever saw my daddy. What legacy are you building for your children? Are you reading your word? Are you living your word for them? Are you shining your light for them? Or are you caught up in the gods of this world? Judgment is coming. Not if Jesus returns, but when. So a faithful, sensible, wise servant is one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. Pretty clear. You have a responsibility of feeding others this word. How can you know this word if you're not reading this word and devouring it, chewing on it, redigesting it, giving it to your children, talking about it when you get up, when you go to bed, when you go on your way, when you sit down to eat, if you're not living by the word? Verse 46, if the master returns, and we just clarified that a second ago about Jesus, our master, it's when, not if. If the master returns and finds that the servant has done a good job, there it is, there will be a reward. <laughs> wow. Why? Again, if the servant's done a good job, he's done a good job. He got paid for it in the first place. He had room and board. He had whatever he had. Why would he get a reward also? Except God is that good. Let me explain this to you again. A servant I purchased, I own him, especially in those days. He is my property. He does what I tell him to do, period. If he doesn't, he gets whipped, he gets beaten, he gets whatever. I have any right to do whatever I want to because he's my property. I own him. He doesn't say, why should I do that? How should I do that? He says, yes, boss. That's what he says. And Jesus is giving us this parable this example so that we can understand that He has bought us with His blood, with His life. That He gave up heaven and came to earth, gave up His life so that we could live for Him. But if we do a good job, we get a reward on top of that. That's just crazy. 
but wonderful. Verse 47, I tell you the truth, the master will put, his, put that servant in charge of all he owns. Now, w w wait a minute. Now, Jesus has given us an example of what he means. Not only did I get a reward, but this word, reward is going to at least include, I get to be responsible for all these things. I get to be elevated. I get to be lifted up. I get to be put in a higher status, a higher paid position. I don't know what it entails. But I know that when the master returns and finds that I have done a good job, he is going to elevate me somehow, reward me somehow. Hmm. What more motivation do I need to do what I should do already in the first place? Right? I mean, I want to hear when Jesus comes back, well done, my good and faithful servant. But we're going to find out there's more to that. We're going to look at that here in just a second. Back to Isaiah. Isaiah 40. Verse 3, listen, and how can you listen unless you're reading, unless you're spending time in Bible studies, unless you're coming to church, unless you're talking to one another about God's Word, unless you're talking it over with your children. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make a straight highway through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed. Scripture tells us that God is being patient because He wants all that will come to Him to come to Him. If we get busy, that day will come. Think about that. They'll be saved and Jesus will return and He'll wipe every tear from our eye. Mm. It's a day that I want to look forward to. Verse 5, Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, Shout! I asked, What should I shout? Shout that the people are like grass. What an odd thing to shout. <laughs> Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in the field. Oh, do you remember about Solomon again? When Jesus gave him as an example? And said that Solomon in all of his glory wasn't dressed as good as that wild lily out there that did nothing but let God clothe it. Mm. If, our, if we are to be compared like grass, which is here today and gone tomorrow, shouldn't you think about how you spend your life living to bring Him glory and honor? He's going to use you for glory and honor anyway. You see that all throughout the Bible, whether you're a good king or a bad king. The kings, not just the common people. He used them to bring him glory and honor, period. Because he's sovereign in control and he's doing a wonderful, mighty thing that all heaven and earth are going to be so amazed about that day and night we can never stop singing, Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty. Verse 7, The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. So much truth here if you'll take time to understand it. And the Spirit of God has been given to you so that you can understand it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, and then Jesus left the Spirit behind so that we would be priests, that we'd be born again, so that this could be explained to us more as we read it more and we devour it more so we could grow to maturity to be more like Christ. It has to be a part of your diet. It is more important than the daily bread you eat to nourish your physical body. It nourishes your soul. Verse eight, 9, O Zion, messenger of good news... <laughs> And we're the messenger of the gospel message, the, the love of God the Father through Jesus Christ. Shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder. O Jerusalem, shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. We have the blessing and privilege to announce that Jesus Christ came. He died for our sins and He will come back. And He will reward those who diligently seek Him. Verse 10, yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. You see this pattern of rewards? <laughs> Don't miss it. Don't miss it for the servant who does a good job. That you'll get rewarded. 
So let's go back to the New Testament. Look at Jesus' words again. Luke chapter 12, verse 27. Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. But Solomon tried so hard to do that, didn't he? And let his only son that we know about, about after thousands of them, literally, down the wrong path. Even though he right, trust in the Lord, acknowledge him in all thy ways, and he will direct your paths, right? Lean not unto your own understanding. But he didn't teach his sons that by the way he lived. Reminds me of Matthew 24, verse 45 again. That was a scripture from this morning. A faithful, sensible, wise servant is the one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth, listen up, verily, verily, so you understand this, the master will put that particular servant in charge of all he owns. Wow. Okay, let's go back to Luke 12. Sorry, I digressed. <laughs> Look at the lilies and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. The wisest, greatest who ever lived... There's your example. God gave him all this wisdom and he still blew it. <coughs> Means nothing compared to what God can simply do for a wildflower out in the field if he'll just be obedient. And if God cares so wonderfully for flowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, verse 28, he will certainly care for you. <sighs> Isn't that refreshing? Why do you have so little faith? And don't be concerned about what you eat or what you drink. Don't worry about such things. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world. Didn't Solomon realize that in all of his wisdom? But your father already knows your needs. Here's what you should do. Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Wait a minute. It said before that Jesus is going to put me in charge of all that he had. I don't know what that means again, but we're talking about the kingdom of God? I don't know how these things relate, but wow! <laughs> Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. So don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives your father great happiness to give you the kingdom. It's what pleases him. So sell your possessions. Get rid of them. And give to those in need. This will store up treasures, treasures, for you in heaven. And the purses of heaven never get old or develop holes. Your treasure will be safe. No thief can steal it. No moth can destroy it. Where your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So that you don't build alliances with foreign kings and marry their daughters. So then that you have hundreds of concubines and wives and thousands of illegitimate children born not the way God ever intended, not walking the path that God intended, dividing the kingdom of Israel in two and bringing destruction upon them. That's where we're at in the book of Isaiah. Wherever your treasure is, verse 34, there the desires of your heart will also be. So verse 35, be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. Be wise. Don't just be dressed and say you're a servant, but be wise in how you serve. Verse 36, as though you were waiting for your master retur to return from the wedding feast, then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. Wouldn't it be much better to be ready and waiting for Jesus than to be caught off guard? <laughs> Just think about that one thought. I want to be ready and waiting, my lamp burning brightly, using all that He's given me wisely to bring Him glory and honor. Not just being a servant, but a wise servant. Verse 37, the servants who are ready and waiting for His return will be what? You fill the blank in. Rewarded. Wow, look at that pattern again. Rewarded. <laughs> I don't understand it, but it says it, so I believe it. 
Then he says it again, I tell you the truth, verily, verily, listen up. He himself, the master who returns, Jesus, will seat them, put on an apron, and serve them as they sit and eat. What crazy love has the Father lavished upon those that we should be called children of God. Back to Isaiah, chapter 48. You see, I'm moving through it fast. <laughs> Verse 1, listen to me. Listen to me. You've got to read it to listen. O family of Jacob. Let me put in here, O Christian, O church. You who are called by the name of Israel. Oh, even more. You who are called by the name of Christ. Christian, like Christ, little Christ. That's what you're called. That's what you say you're called. You who are called by the name of Jesus and born into the family of God instead of family of Judah. Listen to you who take oaths in the name of the Lord and call on the God of Israel, you don't keep your promises. Things haven't changed, guys. If you're not guilty of it, I'll hold my hand up. I am guilty of not keeping my promises to God over and over and over again. But by His grace, each day is new and He lavishes grace upon me and tells me to repent. And I do my best to do that. By His power, not my power. By His will, not my will. <laughs> because mine is quite contradictory most of the time. Verse 2. Even though you call yourself the holy city and talk about depending on the God of Israel. Let me read it this way. Even though you call yourself Christian and talk, and talk about church things. Sorry. Depend on the God of Israel, whose name is the Lord of heaven's army. Verse 3, Long ago I told you what was going to happen. Then suddenly I took actions, and all my predictions came true. Now we have Isaiah doing it again. And we'll have it again and again in Scripture, because God is beyond all space and time. He is sovereign above all things. Okay? Verse 4, For I know how stubborn and obstinate you are. Whew, thank goodness he knows me well. Your necks are as unbending as iron. Your heads are as hard as bronze. That is why I told you what would happen. I told you beforehand what I was going to do. There is no excuses. You know what God has for you. He bought you with the blood of Jesus Christ to be like Jesus Christ. Jesus even said to be perfect like your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew chapter 25 comes after 24. It just works that way if you don't understand that. And Matthew 25 starts, remember there wasn't the chapter breaks and stuff, so we would keep on reading. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. See where we had that just tied before? He's using that same analogy. Now I'm not going to get into that, but this is the analogy that Jesus used. You can go read it. Verse 2 is what I want to point out. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. They were still servants. They were still brides. Whatever you want to say, they were still waiting for the return of the groom, however you want to put it. But five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. I don't want any part of this. I want to be the wise ones, the good stewards who get a reward when Jesus returns. If you keep on reading in verse 14, Jesus gives a second parable explaining what he was explaining in chapter 24. Again... So this should teach you even more. The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together who? His servants. And he entrusted his money to them while he was gone. And you know what that means? That's even more serious than just you've got a job. He entrusted this earthly kingdom into his servants' hands to continue the... Bible study that we're doing in Sunday school, Jesus continued to continue the works of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul calls us a body. We are the body of Christ, the hands and feet. We have the good news. We have a responsibility. We've been entrusted with the gospel message to take it to a dying world. That when this coming of Jesus happens again, just like the coming of the flood, the doors will be shut and no one else will enter. And we have the, the opportunity, the privilege, anything you want to say to get people on that boat before it's too late. 
He called his servants together and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. Verse 15, he gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the last, dividing it in proportion to their abilities. Then he left on his trip. Now don't concentrate on the wrong things. Concentrate on a servant, a master. He's entrusted you. Why did he give the one five? I don't know. Why did he give the one two? I don't know. Why did he give the one one? I do know what it says here. Because he already knew their abilities. Now think about that a second. If you were born in this day and age, in this country, you got five bags of silver. Sorry. There are people that don't hear about the Word of God, don't have a place to lay their head at night, don't know if they're going to face life or death each day, don't have the printed Word of God, let alone the digital Word of God, and whatever version they want it in, whatever Bible studies they want, wherever church they want to go, and you do. You've got five bags of silver. <laughs> what are you going to do with it? You didn't get the two. You didn't get the one. You got the five. I'm going to get that point across. So what are you going to do with it? That means that God gave you that because, again, He's sovereign, and He knew that Alan was going to be born, and I can put any one of you guys' in, name into that same spot in this day and age, and He gave you five bags to do with it based on your abilities. If you don't do it, it's because you were a lazy, worthless servant. This, this, I'm getting this from Scripture, so don't throw too many rocks at me. You've been given five bags of silver. So let's read on. You've been entrusted based on your abilities. The servant who received five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Okay, I've already told you you're the five. After a long time, their master returned from his trip, and he called them to give account of how they used his money. So we're going to concentrate on the fifth one again. We're going to count, concentrate on the faithfulness. That's what this sermon's about, not the unfaithfulness. The servant whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. Verse 21, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what we say we always want to live for, that one, right? But there's more to this story. You've been faithful in handling this small amount. <laughs> so now I will give you many more responsibilities, many more rewards. Let's celebrate together. Verse 22, the servant who had received two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two, two more. Verse 23, it's identical to verse 21. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you more responsibilities. Identical for the two and the five. Got me? Let's celebrate together. Verse 24, Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, look, here is your money back. But the master replied, You wicked and lazy servant. Okay. If you knew I harvested crops I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I would have gotten some interest on it. Then he ordered, Take the money from this servant and give it to the one with ten bags of silver. Okay. Not concentrating on the one. We're back to the guy with ten. Wait a minute. Why did he give the one to the guy with ten? Why didn't he split it between the guy with one and five? They did the same job, right? Hmm. Because he gave the person with ten more in the first place because he knew that they would, could, should do more with it. You understand that? That's why I said you all are guys that got the five. You've been given so much in this world. So much to be responsible for. It's right here in front of you to read and study it and live it and show this world the love of God through Jesus Christ, your Savior and Lord, or waste it. I don't think I can be much clearer than that. And Isaiah was a voice crying out for a people to come to repentance. 
We are the children of God trying to tell the world to repent, but we've got to study this word, live by this word. So, if you keep reading, there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's because there were goats that thought they were sheep, but they weren't on that day. I hope and pray everyone here is a sheep, but I don't want you just to be a sheep. I don't want you to be just a servant. I want you to be that wise servant so that you will be, bring glory and honor to God, but also so you'll be rewarded. So today I am going to reward some of you. Give you a glimpse of this. I've called this on my notes, glimpse of reward ceremony. Because I want you to see that. You have been given so much. Use it wisely. And then on top of that, Jesus said, I will come and bring my reward. So we've got some plaques made. Jacob and Michaela made these plaques. I told you about it. And you guys who have been faithful reading. And guess what? you still got roughly a half year to, to either jump on board, get caught up, however you want to do it, and maybe we'll have another reward ceremony. I know some people who have been faithful, but I don't know all. And you may not get a plaque today because uh, we got a little girl in the hospital that was making them. But she will get you one. And if it's a husband and wife team, we'll be glad to make a second. We've talked about that plaque with the Bible verse you want. But the plaques that, when I say we, I just told them to do it. Let me get we out. Put Jacob and Michaela in there. They have this Bible verse as a reminder. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Correct? Every day is. What will we do? We will rejoice and be glad in it. We will trust. We will tell one another. That's why we picked this verse. But it can be whatever verse you want. Now, who's been faithful in reading? Evelyn, I know you have. Come up here and get you one. If I miss anyone, it's not because I want to miss you. It's because I don't know. <laughs> okay? Yeah, she's pointing at Barb. Barb? I'm pretty sure Teresa has. Okay. I think Mark even has. You hold off and we'll get you a different one. But you're recognized. Stand up, let them see you. <laughs> okay. Marianne? Right? Sherry's in the nursery. She is. And you know, this has been so wonderful because we... Oh, sorry. Yeah, you can pick out whichever one you want. That's one you want? <laughs> yeah, but wait. I don't want one. I just want my name acknowledged. Yeah, I did. And I'm just finishing, finishing up. This has been so wonderful because Sherry and I will get on Bible studies and it'll last for a season. This has lasted for going into the seventh month. Reading together. And I'll tell you a wonderful thing last week. We were on the back. This has been hectic couple weeks. Um, we were on our back, way back from the walk meeting in Tri-Cities, and she's like, are you, it's this Saturday. She's like, are you caught up on your reading? I'm like, nope. And I try my best to be caught up by Sunday, so at least <laughs> when I'm telling you that I could hold myself accountable. She said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll read to you as you drive. Yeah, I cried. Because <laughs> my wife was reading to me so that I would be caught up. Now that's a wonderful feeling. Who else? Catherine, come on. I told you if I don't think. Huh? Terry, are you? Come up here. Okay, get caught up and tell us Look at that. Is there someone I missed? David, are you? Okay. David, stand up. Now, there's no condemnation whatsoever. There's just a difference in the wise servant. Do you see that? There's still the person that got the two bags. They got, well done, my good and faithful servant. So you can use this phrase, I hate this phrase, I'll just be glad if I get to heaven. That's an okay phrase, 
but depends on the motivation of your heart saying, yes, I will be so thankful for the grace of God getting to heaven. But if that's what you say because I'll just drag my tail through this life and, and love God with half your heart, no. That's a terrible thing. And Jesus is clear about that. He said on that day there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth because there will be people that said, yes, I love you, Lord, but they didn't. That's why the first New Testament letter that was written was James saying that. Jesus loves every one of you enough that He laid down His life for you. Will you give up your idols and live your life for Him? Thank you for you guys that have been faithful. You've helped spur me along also. Thank you. Father in heaven, we just thank you and praise you. We thank you that you are a gracious, loving God, that you created us and gave us life, that you redeemed us back at the cost of your precious Son, and that you'll reward us for doing a good job. Oh God, you are such a wonderful God. We thank you and praise you. Open up our hearts, our minds. Help us to hear your words. Apply them to our lives. And Lord, let us count on the blessings that you give us. Let us name them one by one as we re rejoice in each and every day that you have made and given us life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.